Now, before we go into our keynote um, lecture, and before I actually read Dr. Nurse's official bio, I have to share just a brief, um, my own brief description of Dr. Nurse um, when I first experienced his, his, his energy in a lecture a few years ago at the UAE Open Campus. Uh, up the morn. I remember at the end of, of the, the lecture, I thought, my initial thought was, surely he has to be one of the next emerging Nobel laureates out of the region. That was my thought to myself. And then I stood next to him to take a photo. And I normally I get the, the question, oh, you're very tall. How tall are you? And in that very moment, Dr. Nurse made me look like a dwarf. So he's quite the giant, gentle giant in, in a person, but also a very giant mind. And so with that, I want to formally introduce to you Dr. Keith Nuss, who is the principal of the Sarafa Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. He has recently worked as senior economist and advisor on structural policies and innovation at the OEDC Development Center in Paris. He has worked also at the University of the West Indies as the World Trade Organization Chair. He serves on the Executive Bureau of the UN Committee for Development Policy, a subsidiary body of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. He serves also as a member of Hemispheric Program Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture. He is a former member of the Economic Development Advisory Board to the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Nurse has worked as a researcher and consultant to governments and international and regional organizations around the world and has published on a wide array of issues, issue areas such as trade policy and services, industrial policy and innovation governance, creative industries, tourism, migration, diasporas, gender and economic restructuring, climate change, and sustainable development. And so tonight, Dr. Nurse will be presenting to us under the theme, Creoleness slash Creolity Culture and Cultural Creative Industries in National Development Today. Dr. Nurse, it is an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And that being said, I pass on hosting duties now over to you. Thank you, uh, Louise. It's a great pleasure to be here. After that rousing um, introduction, I feel uh, almost inadequate uh, already. <laughs> but it's a real pleasure to be um, the feature speaker at this year's conference. We all know we are living through unprecedented times. And normally, or in the good old days, we would have done this um, face to face, where I could actually see the audience and draw from their energy. Um, and you know, in the Caribbean context, um, we talk about call and response as part of our um, means of communicating, particularly in the performing arts and so forth. So um, I'm missing that element of the, the process. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we can um, make up for it with, uh, you know, hopefully a good presentation on my part and some good Q&A from the audience. So let me um, get to sharing my screen. I, I did prepare a PowerPoint. I, uh, I apologize <laughs> for those who wanted to hear me just elucidate. Um, but I wanted to share some some critical perspectives. I will try to be quick about it so that we have more than enough time for us to, um, to have some open discussion about the critical issues. So let me see if I can make this happen with the share screen.
Okay. Uh, can you see me? Can you see the presentation? Well? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank the organizers for giving me what I think is one of the most challenging titles I've had to deal with in a long time. Um, Creoleness, creality, culture, cultural creative industries, national development. If you look at all of those terms, they are all very loaded. Um, they are all very value laden. They are also all very contested. So, for example, just the word culture, um, Raymond Williams argues that the word culture is the second, if not the third, most difficult word in the English language because it has so many different meanings. Um, he doesn't tell us what is the, the most difficult word, in, at least in English, but uh, um, culture is a very slippery term. Uh, it can mean multiple things. But in my presentation, I'm going to uh, work through two key elements. One, culture as expressions. So much of the discussions thus far um, uh, for this evening's conference have talked about cultural expressions, the language, the dress, the cuisine, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that um, in literature, we refer to that as culture with a small c. Culture with a big c refers to culture in the grand sense of things, which is what are our cares and fears? What are our value systems? Um, how do we find ourselves in the cosmos? Um, or how do we find ourselves as part of a region even? And, um, and so I'm going to do an interplay between the two. I will try to highlight where I'm making the distinction. I, my, in my work, I veer more to the latter. I'm, I'm interested in the big picture of which the cultural expressions are but a part. They are both uh, generated by the grand notion of culture, uh, but they also inform the grand notion of culture. So it's not an either or scenario. The, the other thing I'll talk about is the concept of national development. Uh, this also is a challenging construct because often in many countries, and particularly in the case of the Caribbean, our societies are very transnational. And in many respects, they have been so from the inception as modern societies, meaning um, since the collision of globalization, colonization, and the expansion of the European um, global political economy. So for at least the last 500 years or so, the concept of national development, as sometimes it's defined, is really a misnomer. Um, much of what happens in our spaces have been informed through global processes. Um, in fact, the, the people who populate the Caribbean all come from somewhere else, by and large. Um, we have largely, um, through a process of cultural genocide, eliminated most of the indigenous populations. Which brings me to what my presentation is about in part, focusing on creoleness and creolity. So what do we mean by creoleness and creolity? Well, for the last couple of days, I've been doing my reading. I've even had to draw on some of my colleagues from UWI to help me think through some of this because I'm not a cultural anthropologist. Um, I'm not a Creole specialist. So what do we mean by it? Because I always like to start from first principles. Um, you can go through the literature. Creolity is defined as a literary movement coming out from the Martinicans in the 1980s, very much a response to the earlier work on Creoleness coming from the negritude movement and so on. Um, and it's very much associated with 
the Antilles and the French Caribbean, but also, as I think mentioned by one of the speakers this evening, uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, um, Reunion, um, Haiti, uh, you can go to um, Louisiana, um, and, and in fact, I have had the, the experience of being in Mauritius, where I was hanging out with a few friends from Haiti, from St. Lucia, from Dominica, and from Mauritius, and they were all able to speak in Creole and understand each other perfectly. Um, so the concept of the Creole is, is global. Um, and in this case, we're talking about a French Creole. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very specific here. Um, but if you look at, uh, at how um, Creole is interpreted around just the Caribbean, it has multiple meanings um, depending on which territory you are in. I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, so we have a different version of Creole. So in Jamaica, Creole designates anyone Jamaica, of Jamaican parentage except people who are East Indians, Chinese, and Maroons. So back a country, descendants of runaway slaves, uh, um, who are considered Africans, are not Creoles. Uh, so uh, in Trinidad and Guyana, they exclude Amerindians and East Indians. Um, however, if you read the, the contemporary literature, they talk about Indo-Creole, um, just like we talk about Afro-Creole, Euro-Creole. Um, there's even literature that talks about the Douglarization of Creole. So it's, it's not a fixed construct, it's a moving target. In Suriname, it denotes the civilized colored population as apart from the Bush Negroes, or what we would better call today the Maroon communities. And I've actually done research with the Maroon communities in Suriname, um, and so I can speak um, specifically about that. And then the French Antilles Creole it was often to the local born whites than to the coloreds or black persons, according to Lowenthal back in 1972. And then in French Guyana, by contrast, it's exclusively for the non-whites. Uh, so in Trinidad, we talked about the French Creoles who migrated from Haiti to Trinidad and Tobago when it was um, largely underpopulated, and they were able to bring with them their slaves, um, uh, which allowed them um, to establish plantation agriculture in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Hinson, Percy Hinson, a good friend of mine, talks about Creole nationalism uh, as being differently, new, differently negotiated in places like Guyana and, and Dominica in relation to the Amerindian. So the people who are the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean are largely excluded from the Creole because the Creole refers to those recent or more recent arrivals um, and the clash of cultures among um, those groups. So where does that leave us? Uh, well, Benitez Rojo argues that the Caribbean is a galaxy of many different but similar and interrelated creolization processes, which started with a big bang, the plantation, with European-centered globalization and capitalism, so that in spite of the multiple different, the different ways in which the Creole is constructed in different parts of the Caribbean and even outside of the Caribbean in a place like Mauritius or in Seychelles and at Reunion and other places, um, there tends to be some commonality. And the commonality is the collision with a European-centered um, world where we have the exportation of cultures from the old world to the new world and in part the process of decimation if not cultural genocide of the indigenous populations. Uh, 
That is what we're talking about. So the Creole and Creality, uh, or Criolo in, in the um, Hispanic um, part of the, of the Americas, um, also speaks to this reality. And so that's what I, I want to focus on. Um, because it's the big picture, it explains the grander scheme of, of interactions. But I think it also helps us to situate where we are in the Caribbean relative to other parts of the world. So I like the quotation from Nettleford, uh, Rex Nettleford, who passed away several years ago, who was um, former vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, um, you know, created, a, a, you could say almost a dance community in Jamaica was forged by Rex Nettleford, but he is very much the author, scholar, and intellectual. He talks about the creolizing process as being a continuous one, and that we are the inheritors of a richly textured ancestry, which in turn determines and claims our indigenized Caribbean ethos. I would say that in, in this respect, he's quite correct. Um, if you look, for example, I, I do research, for, for example, on the music industry and the global music industry. The music from the Americas, from the North to the South, with Central America and the Caribbean in between, is the dominant producer of global music. The art forms that have been created in the Americas through this process of creolization have become the dominant forms of popular music worldwide. Whether you're talking about jazz, whether you're talking about hip hop, reggae, rock music, you just name it. Um, it's all been forged in the Americas, largely through the collision of um, multiple cultures from Europe, Africa, but also from the indigenous populations of the Americas. So if it is that the, the art forms from the Americas are so dominant, um, why often are we not claiming it or celebrating it and furthermore, investing in it? Well, I wanted to turn to a quotation that I found today from my good friend, Travis Weeks, um, who I met at the Cavill campus when I worked there and he was working on his PhD. Um, he, I think, made a very interesting um, comment here. He says, Walcott's Place, and this is where we're bringing it down to St. Lucia, is Walcott's Place, most notably those in the entire collection of dream of Monkey Mountain and other plays and the Haitian trilogy draw extensively upon French Creole, incorporating not just Creole songs, but interweaving Creole phrases into the speech of his characters. And I've seen many of Derek Walcott's plays. Um, and, and as you would know, um, we in Trinidad and Tobago, we claim a little bit of him as well, um, because in his formative days, uh, he did operate um, in Trinidad and was part of the intellectual ferment um, emerging out of the 1960s um, and into the 70s in Trinidad and Tobago. Travis goes on to argue that Walcott, because his popular drama just draw from the culture of St. Lucian French Creole, which is energized by African derived folk forms, has locked into the creolizing machine, strengthened it, and brought immense visibility to its literary and artistic potential. And it is here that I really want to, in effect, jump off or to use Travis's notion of a creolizing machine as a framework for advancing the, the discussion and the discourse about um, creolization, creality, and so on. I've done work on the creative industries in the Caribbean and elsewhere for more than 20 years now. 
and uh, and uh, about five years ago, we did some work for CARICOM, uh, developing a strategic plan for the creative industries. And in that, we captured some of the data for the CS territories in terms of the, um, the types of creative industries that were being exported, uh, the value of them, uh, what was the contribution from each of the various um, countries, and so on. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the biggest exports from the OECS region is an audiovisual, followed by design, um, new media, and so on. And that St. Lucia was the dominant um, exporter at 26%, followed by Antigua and Barbuda, um, Dominica, St. Kitts, and so on. If you look at the data, from the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, studies on the impact of copyright on the economies. St. Lucia is actually among the top countries in the world in terms of the impact of copyright industries. And so uh, I always thought that to be um, questionable. I think since I've been living in St. Lucia, what I've come to realize is that um, there are a lot of television stations and broadcasts um, institutions in St. Lucia in relative terms. And so that would have bumped up the contribution of the creative industries sector to GDP in the context of St. Lucia. What we also see in the OECS is that the performing arts has been experiencing huge growth, but also design, but also audiovisual followed by other related goods. Publishing has been in decline, new media. Um, I think if we collected the data more recently, new media would be um, up significantly. And on the right-hand side, we show data that, that um, in some of the earnings in terms of services, um, computer and information services, as well as copyright-related royalties. And we could see that royalties has been on the upswing. Um, one can argue that has to do with the copyright organization um, based here in St. Lucia, which represents um, the, the wider OECS um, subregion. Well, I want to give some examples of where I think we should be going with this. Um, I've been advocating for an expansion of the creative industries throughout the region and elsewhere for a long time now. And the Caribbean has been making some headway, um, but that headway has been slow relative to other parts of the world. Uh, and it is that in many respects, we pay lip service to the creative industries and that we continue to underinvest in the creative industries. When in fact, the creative industries can be an important mechanism for diversifying um, other sectors of the economy. And so it is the synergies that we need to be exploring or exploiting. So the example here of Green Frick Resort, I've only recently encountered them. Um, they have a, a art competition that I think is just about done and they're due to do the judging. Uh, and their goal is to put the art um, or the selected art for, um, productions from the various artists in the, in the rooms at the resort and have those on sale for guests and so forth. But the point I want to make though is that uh, even the name of the resort, Green Fig, refers to what can be defined as a culinary delight here in St. Lucia and in other parts of the Caribbean. And so it really reflects on the use of the Creole, but the use of an indigenous or what can be found, we find as a new indigenous um, element of Caribbean, um, Caribbean contribution to the cultural ecology in the globe. Now, if you could well imagine that every hotel in the Caribbean did the same 
which was to ensure that their rooms were adorned with artistic works from the Caribbean. Now, the Caribbean is the most tourism dependent region in the world. It accounts for a larger share of our GDP than anywhere else in the world. And more people as a, uh, are employed in the sector as a share of total employment than anywhere else in the world. But why is it that our tourism sector has such low levels of value added? The Caribbean has the tourism sector with the lowest value added in the world. And just to put things in perspective, uh, in Costa Rica, which is one of the um, Central American countries, the domestic value added from tourism is upward of 50%. In the Caribbean, it's on average somewhere between 10 and 12%. What that means is that for every dollar that's spent in the Caribbean, only 10 cents to 12 cents remains within the Caribbean. And given that a large share of the tourism and hotel plant is owned by foreign firms, you take that 10 to 12 cents and then you divide it even further. So even though tourism is the main driver of the Caribbean economy, it is a driver with a very shallow value added dimension to it. How can we get hotels, but not only hotels, cruise ships. I had the good fortune of um, having to do a lecture series on a cruise ship, which picked me up uh, and, and my son in, um, in Barbados. And we did come to St. Lucia and we went on to Antigua and St. Martin and then ultimately to Miami. But while on the cruise ship, I did my scouting and homework, of course. Uh, they have an art gallery on the cruise ship. So I went and I asked, um, you know, what works do you have from the Caribbean? Because they have a catalog, they have an online catalog of artworks and they only had a small number of artworks for sale. When I mean a small number, I'm talking about maybe 100 to 200 for sale directly on board. But they had thousands listed in their catalog. And I asked the question, what percentage of your, the art in the catalog, or the visual arts in the catalog, comes from the Caribbean? And the woman was quite ashamed to say to me that virtually none. The Caribbean is the recipient of the, or has the largest share of cruise ship traffic in the world. We account for somewhere between 30 to 35% of all the cruise ship tra traffic in the world. And outside of the, the earnings from when the cruise ships land, we enjoy nothing else in the value addition process from the cruise ship industry. Not even the staff on board. Most of the staff on board, the cruise ships, are from other parts of the world. So the cruise ship I was on, the beauticians were from Eastern Europe. The engineers were from the Netherlands. The management was from the United States. And the performers, they picked up a, a Calypso band from Barbados. And they flew a Trinidadian steel bandman from Los Angeles to Miami and then to Barbados. So that even where we claim to have some capabilities and some competitiveness, we are largely absent from the cruise ship industry earnings as it relates to the creative sector. I've been doing work on documenting the impact of festivals all around the region. One of my favorite areas of research um, has been Dominica's World Creole Music Festival. And I think it's one of the more successful uh, music festivals in the region. And of course, it's about Creole music. And they tap into Creole music from all around the world. So whether it is um, 
bands from Haiti that do Kompa or from Mauritius, Segu, um, you name it, they've been tapping into that. And so they have a clear understanding of what um, can be defined as a Creole world. Uh, in more recent years, they were veering back to what you see in most of the other music festivals in the Caribbean, increasingly focused on um, more popular forms, whether it's from, coming from Jamaica, from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and I thought they were di beginning to dilute the Creole element. Um, so that's something in the reports that I've done for for the Dominico World Creole Music Festival and the organizers, which are the Dominica Destination uh, Agency. Uh, we've argued again and again that you need to invest and maintain your niche um, in the Creole world. I would say Dom um, San Lucia similarly has um, strong capabilities in this area. Uh, and just to illustrate at the college uh, we've recently been asked to do some work in Haiti. And one of our strengths is that we teach Creole at the college. We have a teacher ed program and we have an e-learning academy. So when you put these things, these combinations together, we are in a position to export to, uh, uh, for example, digital education services to the Creole world. And Haiti, with a population of in excess of 10 million, um, can be defined as a major market that um, St. Lucia and other countries in the Creole world and Caribbean should be exploiting. I wanted to do a plug for our upcoming Up Unthink Thought Festival at the college. Uh, but I I wanted to refer specifically to two quotations from Arthur Lewis. He says that music, literature, and art are an important part of the heritage of mankind, as are science and morals. There he is claiming that uh, we need to be investing in, in the arts. And, you know, we really need to be taking this more seriously. So, for example, when I go to many of the meetings about the industrial development and the future of developing countries in particular and the Caribbean, often there's a discussion about us investing in STEM related um, research, but also STEM related subject matters. And STEM refers to science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics. And I keep making the point that STEM is actually old school now. It's really STEAM, where the A represents the arts, and that the arts have been the key driver of growth in the global economy, definitely in the last 10 years. So if you look at the growth of cultural content on the World Wide Web, in fact, it's estimated that 70% of the content on the World Wide Web is creative content. The fastest growing companies on the planet are those that distribute creative content. Look at TikTok. Uh, TikTok, which is basically distributing user-generated creative content, is the most valuable company on the planet today. It's valued at over 100, 140 billion. It's substantially bigger than YouTube. And it's worth more, it, more than the top 10 airlines combined, um, plus some. Um, and so the creative economy is no longer just about creative expressions and the display of it. It's actually now embedded in the new technologies and the distribution platforms. And so the platformization processes of um, in the global economy 
are largely tapping into creative content, whether you're talking about Spotify, whether you're talking about Pandora, um, but also Amazon, um, you know, where did they start with books? Um, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So one of the challenges that the Caribbean is now faced with is that we are so far behind in the process of digitalization, um, furthermore, from platformization. And, um, and in that regard, we do have to make a significant um, increase in our investment. So the last point that Lewis makes is that a society with all the creative arts is a cultural desert. Now, we have a process potentially of desertification of culture in the Caribbean, because as we proceed, if we do not engage in this process of digitalization and ensure that we document our art forms, ensure that our young people have access to our art forms, it may well disappear. It may well disappear in the mind space of our young people. And that would be the death of Caribbean culture. Creality or no creality, um, we may well become a cultural desert. And it's, this is where we need to quickly um, invest in the new technologies, train our young people and our creative entrepreneurs to upskill their, 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 their art forms for the new context. It also means that we need to digitize some of our old um, archival um, works. Um, try finding um, pictures or songs from uh, a previous generation in the Caribbean. More often than not, you have to access that information from the BBC or from some other institution outside of the region. And so um, that is something that we need to correct and correct very quickly. Um, otherwise, we will become increasingly beholden to other people's uh, control of our cultural and creative content. I want to end on that note, um, just to say that what we have done for the Unthink Festival is brought together an uh, interesting array of panelists um, for the creative sector where we talk about creative futures. Um, but we have several other panels throughout the day that will be talking about the issues of national development, regional development, and global development. So I want to pass it back to you, Louise, um, and thank the Folk Research Center for inviting me to participate in today's conference, well, this week conference. Um, I'm open to any questions or comments from the audience. Uh, best regards. Thank you so much, Dr. Nurse, uh, for sharing so many rich insights, uh, your experiences from doing your own research and from in both a, pro, a, a personal and, and passionate as well as professional capacities. Um, I did see a comment here, and so I am inviting everyone who may have comments or questions to please use the raise hand function. Uh, just so that we could maintain some peace. I did see a message from a comment from the chairperson of the Sinatra National Trust, Ms. King, who said that we need to stop changing the names of our bays, Freedom Bay, Sugar Beach, etc., as if our original names cannot be international, cannot have international appeal. It's symptomatic of how our things indigenous are undervalued. Yes, that is a comment by yeah. Ms. King. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, one of my um, comments I always make when I make presentations here in St. Lucia is that um, Lucia makes the best cassava bread in the world. Plas cassava is like um, you know, one of my favorite places in the world. But why can't I get it in a hotel? Or why can't I get it more regularly um, in the supermarket. Um, so when we talk about the Creole, um, I think that we need to be 
very clear that what we're talking about is creating um, content for consumption in every sphere. That is not just about entertainment. It's actually about our own nourishment as well as human beings. And so, um, you know, wheat, we eat a lot of wheat in the Caribbean. We are one of the highest importers of wheat per capita in the world. It is very much related, uh, more than likely, to the fact that we have the highest rates of chronic non-communicable diseases. We eat a lot of white bread in the Caribbean. Whereas in North America, um, brown bread or, or um, more complex um, wheat products have surpassed um, white bread for more than a decade now um, for health reasons. So we're not just talking about entertainment here. We're actually talking about redressing the issues of um, poor diet uh, throughout the Caribbean. But also we're talking about employment and generating new exports. So can you imagine if every hotel had a cocktail cassava bread available for breakfast, as opposed to what they now have, croissants, bagels, etc. We wouldn't have an employment problem as we now think about it. Um, and so some of the hotels in the region, and I would dare say that the English speaking Caribbean with maybe the exception of Jamaica um, is largely underserved by having um, indigenous foods on the menu. If you go to Dominican Republic, um, to some extent, as well as in Cuba and a few other places in the Caribbean, you get mostly a Caribbean breakfast um, at the hotels. Caribbean fruit, Caribbean cuisine, but in the English-speaking Caribbean, it's largely absent. So that our hotel product and our tourism product um, says nothing about us as a people. Um, it's us still trying to mimic others. And yes, I know I have many friends who are hoteliers and they keep making the argument, well, that's what, they, um, that's what the tourists want. Uh, that's a bit of a crock, <laughs> if I may say so. Um, uh, in part, it has to do with cost. It's cheaper to import um, what is now offered um, than to... I, to source locally. But in Jamaica, there's been a strong program, I think among sandals, um, to generate indigenous output from the agricultural sector and infuse that into the cuisine in the hotels. So it requires some deliberate effort and a strategic intent to make it happen. It's not just gonna happen purely by the market. You have to tilt the market to ensure that this happens. Do we need the government to legislate this? Well, often that doesn't work very well. What I think we need is, particularly in the context of the pandemic, to reinvent our tourism, to tap into the increased potential value added, but also this would ensure that we make our tourism more competitive and less, um, and in fact, more resilient in the context of um, global pandemics or global disruptions in, um, in trade um, and so on. So I, I just wanted to jump on that point to illustrate uh, um, what I think the, the commenter was raising. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ness. I am um, the comment, the questions are coming in the chat room. So I will just read them from there. Would you say that the marketability of Creole culture is usually thought of in the context of tourism development? Accessing local markets seems secondary. The aim is to sell to foreigners rather than transmission to locals. Mm. Well, I, I think my comment just now <laughs> in part answers that. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, you can, you can often, and you see this around the Caribbean, we take our 
um, creative art forms and we put them on display as, as curiosities for tourists often. That has its place. Uh, I'm, I'm not knocking it completely. Um, but it's also that uh, we need to ensure or encourage more of our domestic population, particularly our middle classes and even our working classes, to invest in some form of Caribbean art. Um, they consume all of the music because um, this music has this ubiquitous capability of spreading around um, our communities. But if you look at our visual arts, um, going to the average um, Caribbean home, is there any art on the walls that come from the Caribbean? Invariably, the answer is no. Um, and so even the visual understanding of what it is to be, the, to be Caribbean or to be Creole is not being reinforced in the home. Far more for at our educational institutions. Um, we are not even um, embracing these ideas as part of our curriculum or in terms of public art at schools or in our um, various venues. Uh, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean does a better job of this than the English-speaking, and to some extent also the French Caribbean does a better job of it um, in terms of investment and also to some extent the Dutch Caribbean. So I would say the English-speaking Caribbean is one of the, um, has the lowest level of investment in public art. Uh, and so it's not made part of our everyday. Um, so it's largely embedded in our musical art forms, yes. Um, but once you step out of music and you're going to film, performing arts, theatrical areas, and, um, and, and, and so on, um, it's fairly weak. Thanks, Dr. I just want to, okay. So Mr. Laura Japier has had his hand up before we come back to some of the comments and um, the questions in the chat room. So Mr. Japier, you may proceed. Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ness, thank you for taking us through that journey. Appreciate your insights. But I want to go beyond <laughs> Beyond the the um, the creolization machine, <laughs> beyond the creolization machine, beyond the creative industry, beyond the language policy and the economic values of the creole, I want to focus on the landscape. And when I speak of the landscape, I speak of the language itself, which um, is, in is an endangered language, or, or it's almost in the same realm as ecocide, what I call lingocide. And as Wade Davis puts it, he says that the, the whole web of life is made up of the ethnosphere and the biosphere. It completes the web of life. And language is an integral part of that web. In fact, it, it was Fanon who says that language carries the weight of any nation. And so language, if without language, it's the Tower of Babel. It's, it's what I would call a, um, what, what I would call in, in, in my own terms, a, 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 a Babylon. <laughs> you know, well, it's not my own terms, but we know Babylon. So, well, because human beings instinctively Taxonomize. By taxonomize, I mean give things names, carry names, language, language, language. So my point is, beyond all of the economic value of the language and so forth, how do we preserve the language like we preserve the environment? We know about the economic benefits of the environment and what it gives to us, the Amazon and so forth. But what it is in itself, how do we appreciate that? How do we keep that language alive, which is the bedrock, what, what I call the landscape. 
how do we skip it, uh, the survival of it, like um, Amy says, I would say, so that we're not just black toys in other people's carnival. How do we create our own carnival, our own civilization based on us with our language and, and so forth, not just for the economic benefit, but for what it is in itself. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's an interesting point of view. Um, I agree with you that language carries cultures, but you seem to be referring only to the spoken word. So you can talk about a visual language. And in fact, if you look at our young people, if you look at our young people today, um, visual language is becoming even more important than this. And so you need to broaden, I would argue, your notion that it is purely about the language as a spoken word. Uh, and yes, it's important that every society secures um, certain elements of its language and culture, but they are, they are evolving and they're continuously updating. And if you are not facilitating this process of cultural updating, it will die. So is it being embedded in the new art forms? Um, so when I'm in my car and I'm listening to the radio, yeah, I get lots of denary segment. Um, is it being embedded in film? Uh, you know, I have some colleagues in the film industry and we've had people from St. Lucia participate in the film incubator that I helped founded uh, through Caribbean Tales. Um, and we've been talking about creating a, a World Creole Film Festival. In fact, I've had discussions here in St. Lucia when I was wearing another hat about creating a, dias a Creole diaspora film festival here in St. Lucia. We didn't get much traction. Um, and the point I'm making is this. Uh, you are not going to advance the interests of the of Creole language if it is not embedded in the art forms, if it is not being secured through young people's participation in particular, not to secure just the heritage of the art form, but to make it a lived art form where they see themselves being reflected in it uh, as part of youth culture. Uh, and so the preservationist framework has its benefits, but it must be balanced with a process of cultural updating and a process of cultural uh, intermediation where you are where it's seeping into multiple art forms and different platforms for its execution and distribution. That's my view on it. That's my take. I know that it's a contested area. Um, so, but, I, but I'm just giving you um, the perspective that I've, that I've forged over the years, having to grapple with these issues in multiple jurisdictions all across the Caribbean. So it's not just the French Creole. Um, what about the Patois or the other languages throughout the Caribbean? You go to places like um, Suriname or Curaçao, um, they have an indigenous or, cre well, a created language that comes out of this part of the world. So um, those are things that we need to, to also continually invest in and embed as much as possible into our educational uh, institutions. Thank you. I am agreeing with you, sir. I, I <laughs> just wanted to broaden the discourse. Uh, so it's, it's not focused just on the economic side, but the value of what it is in itself and how we can use it in whatever ways we, to, 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 to build wealth and so forth, but what it is in itself, the value of what it is and, 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 and the weight that it carries as a people. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, well, I, I agree with you completely, yeah? The, um, that's why I said, I think at the beginning, the, the cultural expressions both are informed by the grand culture, but they also help to generate the grand culture. And it's the interface between the two that needs to be sustained. And um, so the expressions themselves um, need to inform the value systems. So just having uh, the art form for art form's sake is not enough. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think we're on the same page. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nurse, and thank you, uh, Laura. Uh, what, so just as a housekeeping matter, what seems to be happening there is just the crashes just seem to be out. So uh, we will not be interrupted. We rebuke any falls that does not belong. It will not be happening. <laughs> I will have to report some of them. Um, Dr. Nurse, this one is very specific to um, your, the institution that you now lead. Uh, the question is, will Safa Lewis Community College be developing more creative arts programs for certification and general development of our artists? Of course. Um, I do practice what I preach. So it's, we already have a, what we've now created as a, a unit on digital humanities. Um, we have a long title, Digital Humanities, New Media, and Creative Industries. And so we have several um, programs at the associate degree level in this area. We don't have a bachelor's degree offering just yet. Um, but you know, we do have an associate degree program in creative industries and event management on offer. The number of applications for that has been very, very, very low to my dismay. So I hear the need for us to um, put this on offer and we have put it on offer, but very low uptake. So it means that, in fact, we have ha been having discussions about how do we pivot in another direction. So one of the things that we are planning to offer later this year is a digital and creative academy where we train more at the um, practitioner level and the entrepreneur level, the key skills that are required to participate in the burgeoning digital creative economy. So that's understanding everything from e-commerce to understanding how to um, leverage your content on the various social media platforms, um, to knowing how to generate, um, you know, utilizing new digital tools, um, creative content. Uh, so that's going to be the focus of that um, program. So that's still in development, but we are hoping to offer that later this year. We have been having discussions also about um, offering uh, training in um, song engineering, as well as um, further um, training in animation and new media. Our challenge there has not only been accessing equipment, but accessing physical spaces to do this in. Because um, as you well know, the college's um, buildings, are, many of them are fairly old and, um, and some of, a lot of, most of them are not suitable for what we want to do in the creative arts area in terms of this kind of training. So uh, that, that we, we have some things under that we do, we're doing a bit of a work around with a strategic partner in this area. So look out for some further um, offerings, uh, but more than likely at the um, practitioner um, level uh, in the first instance. Thank you for that, Dr. Nurse. Uh, in case anybody has, I see a lot of comments coming into the chat, but in case anybody wants to 
uh, voice, please feel free to use the raise hand function. Uh, Dr. Ness, another question is, Flo says, thank you, Dr. Ness, for such a pertinent presentation. I appreciate it. What is your view on building on the linkages with Martinique and the shared Creole heritage in developing the region's creative economy? Wow, yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've visited St. Lucia many times, um, in excess of 30, 35, 40 times. Um, this is the first time I'm living here. And um, mind you, um, basically when I arrived, COVID arrived as well. <laughs> so that has restricted travel. One of the things that strikes me about St. Lucia, because I see St. Lucia as, a, as an important hub in the Caribbean, because it straddles both the Anglophone Caribbean and the Francophone Caribbean. But what strikes me though, is the, the low level of interaction between St. Lucia and Martinique. I don't understand it. Uh, that it is, it is swimmable, yet the interactions are so low. And it can be argued that it is because of language, as is the case in most of the other English-speaking Caribbean, because you all speak the same Creole. So what is it that um, doesn't allow for a higher level of interaction between the two? Is it immigration issues? Um, I'm not sure. I don't have the answer. You probably have to ask people who have been living and working here in this sector to answer that question. Uh, what I do know is this, is that in Martinique and Guadeloupe, they have several initiatives to expand the creative sector and they've begun to invest quite considerably. Uh, I think there's a lot of synergies that can be explored. Uh, and I would also include Dominica as part of that mix. So that uh, for me, that's where the, the action is, that there needs to be a constellation approach, a cluster approach and increase moving of resources and people back and forth between these territories to generate the, um, the value added that we're talking about. Uh, but for me, it's a curiosity why there is not more activity. Thank you for that, Dr. Ness. We actually have a comment and question from Mr. Steve Etienne, who is the former uh, CEO of the um, ECHO, and I, it, it, it was interesting that to see the point you made about the collection of royalties and showing that, that um, representation in the graph. So to his point, as usual, a wonderful and informative presentation by Dr. Ness. I do believe, alas, he is speaking largely to the converted, a group who is aware and understand the challenges, but are not equipped as individuals to address the matter, such as low added value of cultural products. Are you aware of our government's, are you aware of our government's, I guess, efforts of our government's being made? Um, no, this is, maybe my reading is failing me now. Are you aware of our government's being, I guess, making any effort of these potential opportunities to benefit our country and cultural industries? In other words, everyone is speaking about it. Everybody recognizes the, the potential, but is anything being done at the macro level? Well, I, I have to talk to my good friend, Steve, for asking me that hard question, right? <laughs> and I'm mindful that it's election season and all of that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I've read the, the cultural policy of St. Lucia. I've read all the documentation. I, I know the landscape fairly well, um, not just in St. Lucia, but across the whole Caribbean. Uh, St. Lucia is not doing enough. I, I could say that without fear of contradiction. I've said that again and again in multiple locations, but it applies to almost every other Caribbean country. Um, by and large, our governments pay lip service to the cultural and creative industries. It's also that 
we don't have people working in the various ministries and agencies who have a firm grasp of the cultural and creative sector. What do I mean by that? Um, in most ministries of culture across the Caribbean, uh, we don't have people who actually understand the business or, the, or creative industries as an industry or as a sector. They may know something about the art forms and the expressions, but they don't know about the business of it or the trade. And so they can then pass on that information to the people in the sector and know can they inform the policy agenda. So that's point one. Point two, if you look at our ministries of culture all across the region, by and large, they get the smallest share of the, the budget. Uh, historically, uh, they get a very, very small share of the budget. Even in places where the cultural and creative sector makes a really important contribution to the economy. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Trinidad and Tobago's carnival accounts for the largest inflow of tourists. It accounts for 12% of the tourist arrivals and close to 15% of the earnings to the tourism sector from a three week, um, from data generated from a three week um, visitor survey. So it's more than likely in excess of that. Um, but what share of the budget does the cultural sector get? In relative terms, very low um, compared to other sectors of the economy. The third point is that our documentation in the creative sector is embarrassingly weak in the Caribbean. And, um, and so our capacity to make the advocacy to a prime minister or to a minister is also very weak. So we could try arguing based on emotion that the, the cultural creative sector is important for humanity, for sustaining our culture, et cetera, et cetera. That has generally had very little impact as a form of argumentation. Um, so if we are unable, unable to tell a minister what share of employment or what share of exports or how this is informing or generating uh, earnings in other sectors like the telecom sector and so on, um, we are not going to win the argument because we're competing with other sectors that are better armed with data and information and so on. So uh, there's only one or two exceptions in the Caribbean. Um, if you go to Cuba, they could tell you everything about the 120 plus festivals that they have. They could tell you how many tickets were sold. They could tell you how much was earned by artists. They could tell you how much has been exported etc. No Caribbean country, right, by exception one or two, can tell you anything about their festivals, how much it earns, what's the contribution, etc. etc. We take snapshots every so often. They employ people like me to come and do an economic impact assessment. One year, the following year, or the next five to ten years, there is no study done. Um, so you cannot win the argument because you are not in the game. Yeah? Right. So it's a sad tale, but uh, I've been working on this for more than 20 years. I've been advocating on this for more than 20 years uh, throughout the Caribbean and other parts of the world as well. I've worked in Mauritius, I've worked in Seychelles, I've worked in East Africa and some of these areas. And um, some of those countries are surging ahead at a faster rate than we are. Why? It has to do with our culture in the grand sense. Our notion of creality 
um, means that we are under investing in who we are. We don't think it's very important. So I'll, I'll end on that note. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Nils. And I think we have one more question, which is actually a bit of a challenge to something you, you said earlier. Um, uh, Lucan says, I do not quite agree with Dr. Nils's perception on the limited cultural interaction between St. Lucia and Martinique, at least not on the informal level. That being said, my question is, should St. Lucia be trying to better align the development of its Creole language with that of the French Antilles? Well, I, I don't know who your commentator is. I challenge her to provide the data. She did say it's informal. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point I'm making. If it stays purely at the informal, we're not going to make any headway. That's what we've been doing ad nauseum in the Caribbean. So, uh, and just to, you know, to illustrate a point, um, I started a, a program at the St. Augustine campus called Arts and Cultural Enterprise Management more than 20 years ago. And uh, we trained a number of people in. So uh, we have some of our graduates who are here in, um, in St. Lucia. I don't know if I should call them out. So Christine Samuel is one of my graduates. In fact, she was in the first cohort so I don't know if she's on, 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 uh, on the, um, in the session or not. Um, but I remember very well when she first articulated what she wanted to do. Uh, we had to develop a business plan, export plan, a strategy. Um, I would dare say that the training that we provided has helped Christine to um, surge ahead in her career. You don't get, um, you know, you don't make headway in the world by, by guess or just purely drawing on talent. You, you, what you have that emerges from a talent framework is exceptionalism. So you will have one or two artists or cultural entrepreneurs who make a huge breakthrough and they celebrated and we love them and so on but what about the 95 percent who are not super talented or don't get a super breakthrough who have to um, live by their art we are not creating the platform and the frameworks to facilitate their growth, their employment, and their entrepreneurship. And so I am saying that this is part of Caribbean culture. Caribbean culture is premised on exceptionalism. We actually facilitate the perpetuation of elite structures rather than the creation of a process that lifts all the ships or all the boats up. That's why Latin America and the Caribbean has the highest level of inequality among all regions in the world. And that's part of our culture. And so it is very much part of the creolization of the Americas. The Americas is premised on high levels of inequality where race is the key factor that drives that process of inequality. It's a huge constraint on our growth. And so if you see creolization as being in tandem with globalization, then the Caribbean and Latin America, as well as North America, as we are seeing, with some of the atrocities in Canada, with the indigenous population and the resident schools, or what we see with Black Lives Matter in the United States, um, the Americas is premised on race, is premised by a collision of cultures um, that have had to come up against European hegemony. And so the process of creolization is a construct of the Americas. Um, so that's where I deviate from maybe some people in terms of talking about 
the language or the expressions. The language and the expressions are a subset of the grand culture. And the grand culture of the Americas is premised on inequality, where race in particular and all the other elements are the basis by which we um, distribute resources and distribute opportunities. So if it is we want to make a big difference, then we need to be having a different conversation, I would argue, about how do we lift all the boats up. Um, and that means that we need to take our cultures more seriously and invest in them because it is through our cultures and their expressions that we are able to dynamize um, these opportunities for ordinary people. Um, that's the work that I've been doing for a long time now. Uh, we've had some successes here and there, um, but uh, for me, that's the point um, that I want to get across in my presentation today, because uh, I suspect it is you, Louise, who came up with that very lofty and challenging title. Uh, I don't know if it is, but you, you pinned or you appended the notion of cultural and creative industries to national development. And, um, and I would argue regional development and global development. And from that standpoint, I think we need to be having a larger discussion about how we can um, take our creativity into multiple spheres, in education, in tourism, in telecoms, in cassava bread, <laughs> you name it. Thank you for that, Dr. Ness. Um, in fact, the, the topic was uh, actually conceptualized by Mr. Robert Lee and uh, with further review by the Education and Programs Committee. There was a little bit of back and forth on refining, but okay, I guess okay. for Mr. Robert Lee as a creative himself, um, he thought that given where we were as a country, given where we are, um, this would have been very, very necessary. I just want to just touch on two more points before we wrap up. Um, I think Dr. Morgan Dalfin is asking whether it's a, we have a, an issue of evaluation uh, in the Caribbean. And then Mrs. Williams follows up by asking, maybe we need to question on re-understand excellence. Sorry, say that last one for me. Maybe we need to question and re-understand excellence. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the things I've been trying to encourage my staff to do at the college, and I apologize, um, I'm not really speaking here on, um, with my college hat. I'm speaking in my individual and professional capacity. Um, but I will say that uh, I am not very fond of the word um, excellence uh, as a for me, it really doesn't say much of anything. Um, I'm interested in what is the value added that you're bringing and how do you measure that relative to any other sphere? So for me, um, because all, all cultures are in some mode, process or motion of comparison. Uh -huh. So if you read the work of Lewis, he was very critical of what he called the Afrocentrists, Afro who argued that we needed to um, embed our culture purely in an African discourse. Um, I know that's a contested issue. Um, similarly, you can argue that Walcott um, you know, critique that, uh, and these two Nobel laureates have become global icons. I think what they're suggesting is that we need to globalize our culture um, and tap into the opportunities that are emerging for us uh, as a people. Um, and to be as open and inclusive as possible. And you can see that, for example, I, in many of the references I made in the early part of my presentation about creality and creoleness 
is that often, you know, there's a discourse about Euro Creole here, Afro Creole there, um, you know, what about Indo Creole? And, you know, and have the Amerindians or indigenous populations also been Creolized? Um, the answer is yes, we've all been Creolized. We live in the Americas. Uh -huh. So that for me becomes the, the thing, the, the thread that joins all of the subregions together, that makes the Americas a whole, uh, that differentiates it from Africa and Europe and Asia. Because a large share of our indigenous population has been um, wiped out. I mean, um, Guatemala, 65% of its populace, population is indigenous. And its next door neighbor, Costa Rica, has a very low share of indigenous population. Okay, so, so you can see that, um, and then in most Caribbean countries, um, the indigenous population has largely been, been wiped out. So, uh, so we are all creolized. We are all recent arrivals to use um, Braffitt's terminology. The, the other comment or question about assessment, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, so I'm challenged to, to make a comment about it or evaluations. Um, if, if, the, if the person is talking about, for example, economic impact assessments, I've done a ton of those all across the region and in other parts of the world. Um, I've been advisor to UNESCO, to UNTAD, to the World Intellectual Property Organization, to the World Trade Organization, and all of these areas. Um, I mean, if I could do a plug, I, I did a paper recently for the World Trade Organization on the rise of the digital and creative economy. So that's accessible online. Um, and I've really tried to document where the global economy is going. Uh, and this sector, is, is really interesting is that it's moving out of the area of content, even now stretching into areas of fintech. Um, because now it's your capacity to utilize e-commerce tools and so on to monetize the content that really matters. So the companies that are making the most money are those that can monetize the content, not those who are producing the content or even those who are, um, well, distribution and monetization go hand in hand. Well, Dr. Ness, thank you for that. Oh, well, Doc, um, Dr. Daphne, so just clarifying that, oh, I was saying that other areas, example, education in the Caribbean are, are similarly not evaluated enough. Okay, that, that was oh, the point okay. he was All making. Right, okay. Yeah, yes. I, I get the point. But, but, but in the education sector, we could tell you how much the government is spending as a share of um, GDP. We could generally tell you how many students are going abroad. We can tell you how many people got degrees. We can tell you um, how many uh, people are at different schools. Uh, there's a lot of information we have about the education sector. Maybe not enough. Um, and maybe we're not doing enough evaluations relative to the investment, but in the education sector, we have a fair amount of information and data. Go to a Ministry of Culture anywhere in the Caribbean, and particularly in the English-speaking Caribbean. They can't tell you much of anything, not even how they're spending their budget or what impact that it has on the sectors. So our Ministries of Culture are, are about the weakest ministries that we have uh, uh, in the governmental sector in the Caribbean. And so we really need to strengthen them. Where you see some, some interesting things happening, like in Trinidad or Barbados and Jamaica, it's the agencies that deal with export promotion that have now become the main engines of transformation in creative sector. At JAMPRO or at Creative TT in Trinidad, um, in Barbados, they had created the Creative Industries Development Agency or something. Um, so no longer are the ministries of culture the key engine of growth for the creative industries um, throughout the region. They've allowed 
other entities to, to just run past them, uh, which is a sad tale uh, and commentary on where we are at. Well, Dr. Nels, on that note, I think we have just about expired our time. Someone is saying that they appreciated the sounds of frogs chirping in the background when you spoke. <laughs> it brought a sense of the Caribbean. Yeah, um, yeah. I have some birds that are building a nest right outside of my, um, of my living room. <laughs> well, there you go. I, it makes that person feel like home. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, it's great to be in St. Lucia. I have a great view. I, I can actually see Martinique. Um, so for me, that's why I find it still a curiosity, uh, but I think there's tremendous opportunities. And at the college, we are just about to launch um, a greater collaboration with um, the French territories, Martinique and Guadeloupe. Uh, just before the pandemic, some colleagues and I visited Guadeloupe and we have engaged in a process of strengthening those relations. So from the education standpoint, I can assure you, we, and at the Swartal Lewis Community College, we will be making uh, increased strides in this area. Um, so I, I am, as I said at the beginning, I practice what I preach. Thank you, Dr. Nurse. And as we close, I wish to thank you for spending the time with us for the enthusiasm from day one when we wrote to you um, and when we re-engaged you uh, for, for 2021. Thank you for sharing your, your insights so richly and so passionately. And I think there were so many key takeaways. Um, the one that really stood out for me was when you said tilt the market. Sometimes it's not even about pivoting, it's about tilting it. And that our Priority, our cultural and creative expressions are not just about entertainment, but it's about our nourishment. So really, really something to, to take away and something to ponder on. And so we thank you and we look forward to uh, more engagements. We invite everyone on here to Unthink Thought Festival happening uh, next week, Tuesday. And the Folk Research Center, we will be sharing the information on our pages as well. So you could look out for more information there, or you could go to the Sir for Lewis Community College's pages to find out more. I also wish to thank um, Pablo, our founder, for being with us and for delivering the welcome remarks. That role was actually supposed to um, be delivered by our, our chairperson of the Education Programs Committee, Ms. Ms. Louis. Um, however, she was unable to, to join us, but nonetheless, I want to acknowledge her guidance and leadership um, of, this, of this event um, in making various decisions as things kept changing, as well as the Education and Programs Committee, and I see some of them um, join us here, including Mrs. Ramona Henry, um, Wynn from the, from the Cultural Development Foundation. I also wish to thank Jesse. Jesse, you were so wonderful in your presentation. And um, thank you for sharing your experiences and your truth and your, your processes as a young researcher uh, in the way that you did. Ms. Caglin, likewise, thank you for being with us this evening and making the document so readily available immediately after your presentation. I saw you share the links um, on the work that you and your team have been doing on the national language policy and we will continue to wish you well and you know you have the full research centers continued support in that regard mr reddy thank you for your presentation your creole program nupaka fu nupaka fall um and for those who may not know fu is is mad or or i guess female fall crazy uh so thank you for for that that icebreaker before we went into um, Dr. Nurse's presentation. I also wish to acknowledge and thank the staff of the FRC, um, in particular, um, Ms. Ashley St. Martin and, and Bernadio Vitalis for their support and the necessary coordination and graphics and, and the other support that they continue to provide. Um, Mr. Lee, thank you so much for being a pillar 
and and uh, in in this process um, from last year in given the, the grand plans that we had to where we are now, um, as well as Mr. Robert Rennie, um, who serves on the Education Programs Committee, but when it was time to put in our heads together on what this new conference or lecture would look like um, in giving of your time and, and your energy. And to everyone who made the time um, to be with us, thank you so much. I see, I saw people from different parts of the world um, despite the interruption by the crashes, we still had a wonderful evening and I want to encourage you all um, to, you know, be in touch with the, the Folk Research Center. This will, be, this will be placed on our YouTube channel and um, for further access by many. I think I saw, okay, the person's hand is down, but thank you, Messy Appeal. Um, have a wonderful night and have some cassava as opposed to bread tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Ness. Bye-bye.